Hey there, Pastor Matt, and welcome to Theology Thursday. Today we are looking at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 14 through 21, and we're going to ask the question, how does Christianity encourage diversity? Now, that question might seem like an odd one to ask, considering Christianity's reputation. We're often seen as those who import through force our religion onto other people. It's a Western religion that is trying to make Africans and Asians into Westerners. That's the common refrain. And you see this actually happening in our country. This isn't just a thing in the past. You see this rise of Christian nationalism, which is not Christian, nor uh, consistent with our original national ideals. We see it right now. Okay, so how does Christianity encourage diversity? Probably not very much. That's at least kind of the common refrain. And yet, as we'll look at later, there is no greater uh, force to encourage diversity in human history than Christianity. Uh, And actually, what is happening right now in the world and other parts is encouraging diversity in ways that we just don't see in any other uh, entity. And so we'll look at that a little bit. Um, But let's read this passage first. And before we do, um, there is Sven. Hey, Svenny. Svenold. Oh, he's a good boy. 100% good boy. All right. So here it is. Uh, Paul begins verse 14 for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Thanks buddy. Uh, therefore all have died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised from now on. Therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The whole bunch of stuff here in this passage Uh, And we don't have time to go through all of it. We'll look at more of it on Sunday morning. But uh, today, I just kind of want you to draw attention to uh, verse 17 here. Uh, The sense here is that there, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Typically, when you think about uh, your identity formation, you form your identity in... um, by differentiating yourself from others. Primarily, it's negative. You say, I don't want to be like that person. I am not like that person. And so that's who I am. And then you construct something positive out of it. That's the usual thing that we do as humans. And it's it's not good. Uh, We kind of need to be broken of that. Um, But this is kind of the natural thing that happens. Uh, In the church, in Christianity, what... Paul is kind of saying here is that that whole thing doesn't matter. Okay. Um, you, you used to be this way. Well, that doesn't matter. Uh, you used to be like this. That doesn't matter. You used to be like this. That doesn't matter. All of us come from different uh, places in life. And what Paul is saying is like, that doesn't matter for your place in the church. Uh, in the book of Galatians, he says that there is neither male nor female, slave uh, nor free, you know, you, rich or poor. You, it doesn't matter who you were, what your earthliness says about you, your race, your socioeconomic status. None of that stuff matters. What matters is, are you found in Christ? If you are in Christ, that person, he, she, whatever, is a new creation. The old has passed away. 
behold, the new has come. And he's not saying, by the way, you stop being a male or you stop being, you know, black or white or whatever. He isn't saying you stop being that. What he's saying is that your place here is not based on any of those things. It's completely based on if you are in Christ or not. There's a tendency, as I said before, to differentiate ourselves on the basis of all these different you know, aspects of ourselves. We divide ourselves from others. We place walls between each other. What Paul's kind of saying here is that there is no dividing walls between Christians. Uh, there especially is not to be a dividing wall in heaven. There will not be. There will not be Lutherans and Baptists and black Christians and white Christians all and all all races in their own little spots with their own little belief sets and little compartments that they fit into. That's not at all the picture. It's of uh, the picture in Revelation is of everyone from every tribe, nation, language, whatever, together worshiping the Lord. In this life, though, we do that. We differentiate ourselves from each other. We separate ourselves away from each other. And that's not good. Um, what Paul says here is that if you are in Christ, there is not you who you were, but rather this new creation. There's something new here. He says in verse 14 and 15, the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore all have died. He, he died for all. You know, that's, and I know this might get a little bit, you know, some people riled up a little bit if you maybe more align with the Calvinist or reform side of things where you say that you know maybe Jesus didn't die for all but only for the elect well kind of seems like he dies for all here now not all receive it right verse 17 he says if anyone is in Christ and the assumption is like there's some who are not but here he says like Jesus died for all that means that uh if you are in Christ you are this new creation. But even beyond that, he says that Jesus died for all. From God's side, he has treated us all with love and acceptance. And even if you haven't received it, God's heart towards you is that of love and acceptance. And the implication of that is that Christians then are to treat each other with love and acceptance long before they're worthy of it. That means that someone who is not a Christian is to be treated by a Christian with love and acceptance. A Christian is to see someone who does not deserve love and love them anyway. A Christian is to see someone that they disagree with and seek to understand them. A Christian is to see someone that they naturally would not find much connection with and see them and know that Jesus has died to connect those two people. He has died to connect us to each other and us to him. Paul says in verse 18 through 20 that all of this is from God. He's who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And it's kind of, this is a gift that the apostles specifically got, but all Christians are walking in this path. Like as we bring the gospel to people, we also are engaging in this ministry of reconciliation. We're helping people come to the Father who has given his Son for them. They're helping people get to know God and be in a right relationship with him. And the result of that is then the people begin to live in a right relationship as well. And so churches then are kind of meant to be a, a, a bit of like a, a foretaste of heaven in that way. Like in heaven, there will be no uh, divisions from diversity. There will be none of that, right? Uh, on earth, we experience it all the time. The church is kind of meant to be a place where we take that image of heaven and we say, hey, this is what it might look like. It might look a little bit like this, where you have liberals and conservatives politically coming together and loving and accepting each other. It might look like, you know, people who are from uh, historically rival nations, uh, people from uh, ethnicities that have experienced great uh, racial discord between, between the races. It might look like this, where those people come together and they love and they accept each other and they call each other brother and sister, where they die willingly for each other, that they love 
each other long before they have proven their lovable uh, nature to each other. That's what the church is meant to be. And, you know, like I get to see this in the church quite a bit uh, where we have people who have pretty doggone conservative political views and pretty doggone liberal views. And they come together and they uh, treat each other well. They love each other. They think each other are crazy and they just love the snot out of each other. Um, I get to see this a lot. Uh, but also see this uh, historically in the church. Uh, there's a, a quote from, uh, she's an apologist, Rebecca McLaughlin. I, uh, she wrote a book uh, called uh, Confronting Christianity. It's uh, answering 12 questions that Christians really ought to be able to answer about their faith, it's answering some common objections. And on this issue of diversity, uh, she ends up kind of looking through the history of the Christian church. And she makes this statement. She says, Contrary to popular belief, Christianity is the most ethnically, culturally, socioeconomically, and racially diverse belief system in all of history. And that actually should not even be debated. It's just the facts of history. If you look at it, Christianity first grew in Africa, in the Middle East, and then eventually it got into Europe and Northern uh, Asia, uh, kind of with the orthodoxy there. Um, but it was incredibly diverse and not just in terms of geography, but socioeconomically. We have examples of this in the New Testament where the poor and the rich are mixing together. Uh, slaves and free men are mixing together. You have all of this going on uh, within Christianity in the very early days. Um, we were a, a people who just kind of demolished so much of the typical prejudices that existed in that ancient world. And, you know, we talk about racial differences being bad today and, and they are, is nothing compared to how they were and how the church came together in it. The differences between just even Jews and Gentiles is drastically more serious, more profound than uh, what existed in America with slavery between whites and blacks. And, and yet the church in those days, they welcomed each other. They had issues. They had to work through them. Uh, but it was an incredibly diverse group of people. And then this continued on through many centuries. And we had a lot of hiccups, as I mentioned before. There's a lot of bad that has happened through the church in name of diversity. Well, in opposing diversity. But even today, we typically think of America and Europe as kind of like the bastion of Christianity. It's not. It's South America. It's Africa. It's Asia. Uh, Europe is increasingly becoming post-Christian. America is probably on its way. Hopefully not, but it seems to be that way. Um, 60% of Sub-Saharan Africa identifies as Christian right now. Uh, by 2050, some people would say that uh, this will be where 40% of the world's self-identifying Christians live. It's, but it's not even just in Africa. You think about in China. China was typically a, uh, it's, it's been a communist country as of late in terms of human history. Um, but the churches has grown there uh, like bananas. And uh, there's some who would say that by 2030, there will be more Christians in China than there will be in America. Uh, and by 2050, it could even be a majority Christian country. We don't know what's going to happen there, but why is it that Christianity can work in Africa? It can work in Asia. It can work in North and South America and in Europe. Why is it that it can prosper in all these places? It's because it's not rooted in those places. It's not culturally defined. It's not rooted in an ideology. It's not rooted in anything in this life. It is rooted in Jesus Christ, this one who died and was resurrected and who has given that resurrection to all. The fact of the matter is that Christianity is an incredibly diverse movement that isn't based in politics. Uh, it isn't based in ethnicity. It isn't based on a tradition. Instead, it is based entirely, exclusively on Jesus Christ in this one who decided to love people who were other than him, people who were different than him, people who were estranged from him. 
he decided to die for them, to bring them into a right relationship with God. That is what Christianity is rooted in. And that's the thing that empowers Christians to then live likewise. Part of being a Christian then is to find people who are different than you and to be about reconciliation there. It's about reconciling the old with the young, uh, with people of one ethnicity with another, uh, people with some one ideology to another. And, and that isn't to say we're just going to get rid of all of our distinctions. Like we're going to stop being men. We're going to stop being women, stop being old, stop being young, stop being white, stop being black, whatever. It's not that, but rather that we would find our place in Christ. We're all coming in in the same place. And so we don't look at each other on the basis of who we are, who we were, but instead on the basis of what Christ values us. And I think Sven is saying, you've talked enough. So I'm going to go. This is the end of Theology Thursday. Thank you for watching. Uh, I hope to see you next time. Bye now.